In the previous episode, I showed how we can replicate a switch statement to map input values to output values. This episode, however, looks at conditional statements. So if you want to work with multiple if statements, instead of providing lots of if statements together, you could replicate the switch function that's available in DAX or Excel. We're going to go step by step through how we can build this and learn a little bit of M on the way. I hope you can join. So last time we discussed uh, a way in which we could map a table like the one here from the input abbreviations to a country name. This time, I don't want to map something just like this, but I actually want to add some conditions. And based on the outcome of those conditions, we return a value, just like the switch function can do. But since M doesn't have a switch function, we're going to build one ourselves. So how can we do that? Well, I prepared a list of uh, conditions and values, just like we would for a switch function. So while building this, I'd like to start with that. So we're going to start from scratch. Now, since we want to be able in a, in a switch function, you're able to provide a condition, return a value. Then if those conditions don't meet, uh, if they don't evaluate to true, you go to the next condition and return another value. A very useful construct to use in M is a list for this, because within a list, like the one on the screen here, we can say, let's see, we could, for example, see that this is the first condition and this is the first answer. Then this is the second condition. And if this condition is true, this is the second result to return. And if none of these return, we could use something like the word fries here and return it as a, as a default value. Now, what's great about these lists is, let me just return this. Um, these lists actually evaluate each of the items in the list so we can preview it. So here's how we're going to work with it. In the end, I want to be able to apply it to this list. But while we're developing, I would prefer to just start with the name UK. So I'm going to start here with a let statement and say that our abbreviation is UK to start with. Then my list, that's the list that we just pasted here, will have the definition of what's on the screen there. And we can give the result of my list. So what are we looking at right now? So this first true condition is because the first item in the list returns true. So what it says is that the UK is part of the list. So there's a list of the UK and and, and NL. And the abbreviation value of UK is found within the list, so it returns true. The second item within the list is what we're going to want to return if this is true. But in case this condition does not evaluate to being true, we want to start continuing to test the next condition. Now, this is the first part which we can use to build our function. OK, we need to continue building this because right now we have conditions and the values to return. We have them mixed. So on our next line, we could say conditions. And I only want to return the conditions from this list. So I could use list alternate. We're going to refer to my list, which is up here. And then I only want to return each one. I'm going to have a repeat interval of one, and we're going to offset one at each step. And now I want to return my conditions here. So what have we now done? This conditions part, our second variable, gives us back this condition and the answer to it, this condition, and it gives us back fries. Because list alternate grabs the first, the third, and the fifth one. And it just keeps on going if we have more. Now, fries we don't actually need here, but let's leave it here for now. Now we're going to need something for our results. Because if our first condition is true, I want to return our first result. And for our result, we could say list alternate. And we have my list, 1-1. One, one, and we don't have an offset at the start. There we go. Now we could have the result as an answer. And now we see that there's rainy and wine and dine as an answer. 
So if the first uh, condition is true, I want to return the first result. And if the second condition is true, I want to return the second result. And let's forget about fries for a moment. This is our default fallback value, which we will discuss very soon. Now let's suppose we're only working with this. In case I now want to return the first value that is true, I can use a function to look for that first value. So I could say uh, return index. And I'm going to have to look for the first, the first time that a condition is true. So if I'm going to look in my conditions list, I could look for list position off. Uh, my list, uh, my, my conditions, conditions here uh, is what we're going to look in. And the only thing I'm interested in is the first value it finds that shows an answer of true. So where the condition is true. Now let's see what happens. If I now get a return index, it says zero. So on the first index position, which is an index of zero, that's where it finds true. But if I would change this to, let's say, friends, it's going to show us one. So an, an index, a zero based index of one is the first value that is true for, for this case. Now, the index position that we have here, we can use that to return the right value from the result range. So remember the result here? It showed rainy and wine and dine. Now, since I changed to friends, I actually say that the friends in Italy, if you match that, I want to return wine and dine as an answer, just like the switch function would. Now, how can I do that? I can say, I'm going to say I have a returned uh, item. And my return item is an item from result, and the index position to return is the return index value. So in this case, it is an index of one, and it will return me wine and dine. And if I click OK, it actually says wine and dine. Perfect. So with this logic, we already have quite a bit. And if I put this back to NL, it's going to return me rainy. Now there's one thing that we haven't covered. And that is that the switch function has a fallback value. So in case our conditions, if they all evaluate to false, then what the switch function has is a last argument with a value that's returned in case none of the conditions are true. Let's see if we can build that in as well. So to know about this, we only have a fallback value if the number of arguments in here is odd. Because if they're even, I'm going to have a condition and a result, a condition and a result, and no fallback value. But if it's an odd number of items in this list, then I know I'm going to have a fallback value. So our first test is going to be, uh, is we need to know what our default value is. So default value. And the test we're going to do is we're first going to count the number of items in the list. I will have list count, my list. I'm going to have a comma here. Just to show you what this returns, it returns us five. Now we could use a function that is number is odd. Open our brackets and close our brackets. And in this case, it's going to say true. So we can make an if condition. So if number is odd. In that case, we want to return the last value of our my list. The my list actually contains the fallback value in the end. So we could say list last my list. If it doesn't have an odd number of values in the list, that means that there is no fallback value. And by default, a switch function then returns a null value. So we could say else null. Here we go. So we now know that our default value, in our case, it's fries because we have an uneven number and fries is the default value. Now the problem is, if I have a value that we cannot find, we need to know how to return the default value. 
Now let's, for example, say we're looking for a random character, three, three times x. Three times x will not be found in this list. So if we go to the return index and put that on the screen, you will find that the list position off function always returns as minus one. This indicates it does not find a match in our list. Now there's something something smart that we can do here. So we know that minus one is returned in case there is no match and a zero is found if it finds the first match. So what if we would increment the return index by one? If we do that, that means that if it doesn't find a value, it will return as an index of zero. And the first, the first true statement it could ever find for a condition, that one would always return one. Now there's only one thing left for us to do. So before our result list, which was here, always consisted of only the results. But now we can actually add the default value which we had, we can add that to the start of that list. So we could have combined result, and we could say, I want the default value in a list, and I can combine it with the results. So if I go back to the result in the bottom here, oh, I forgot a comma here, okay. Then we now have fries, rainy, and wine and dine. Now, if I have the combined result and I give that in my last tab to the return item, then in case I find nothing, I'm going to get a return index of zero. And actually the default value is the first one here. So that index is perfect because if I have a return index of zero, it grabs the first item. Now, if I go here, you can see that I now return the word fries. Perfect. That's just what we were looking for. Now with all this logic in place here, let me just copy it. We're going to go back to the previous step because we actually started out here. I can go to add column, say insert. I'm going to paste all of this here. And instead of making the abbreviation hard coded, I could now reference the abbreviation column. And I could say, this is the description. Click OK. And now when I look here, you can see that there's rainy, rainy here for UK and NL. There's wine and dine for France and Italy. And there's fries, the fallback value for Belgium. Now, the only thing left for us to do to make this a real switch function is to turn this logic into a function. Now, we can easily do that. So what we could do is we could go here. And this was how we started building our function. Here we go. Let me indent that a little bit. Here we go. And we can make that a little bit bigger. Now what's left for us to do to make this into a function is we want people to provide a list here. So we're just going to need this list. And once people provide that list, with all of the conditions and values, we wanted to show the, the outcome. So we could say, we have an uh, my list as a list, and we're gonna pass it with a goes to sign. So it's a, a function uh, expression. And this my list is going to replace everything that we have here, because this is what the user will provide. And we won't be needing this part here. So this is the function that is going to represent our switch statement. And we can press OK. And I'm going to call this switch. Now let me make a duplicate of this. We're going to go back. And I'm going to copy this here. Now suppose that we had started from scratch. We can start from scratch. And we're here at this table again. But the next time we want to make our conditions, we can add a custom column. We can say we have a switch statement, switch. Now we're going to have to pass a list with all of the values that we have. There we go. And instead of referencing a variable, we're going to reference 
the column names because we don't have a hard coded variable here. And now check this out. If I just write description here and I press OK, and uh, let me just make this a little bit clearer here. So we have list contains. This is the next line with list contains. And we have our fallback value. And in that way, we have now rebuilt a switch function for Power Query. Now there's a couple of considerations here. Is this perfect? Not at all. What we did here, it takes a bit of steps and of course, it's fun that we can replicate this, so it's easier for some users who are used to switch. The downsides are the performance is likely much worse than having if then else statements, so the regular control structures are better in that way. And another downside is the logic here, it won't fault. So there's no query folding, so the performance on your uh, uh, computer will be much worse if you compare it to regular if, if statements. So that's some, some stuff to think of. On the other hand, I do think this was a, a fun thought experiment to see what you could do. So by learning all of these M concepts, I hope you could follow this step by step. It is a little bit complex. So if you wanna know a little bit more about this, here's our new definite, definitive guide to Power Query M. It's a, it's a new book on the M language. Uh, it goes into depth about lists, structured values. You can learn about creating your own custom functions. I think it's really cool. And by going through this, you're going to be able to also automate the logic that you're working with. If that's not something you want to have in print, we even have it in an ebook form, but I think, uh, I think it's going to be really useful for you. Other than that, if you also want to know how the other switch function side works, so switch with mapping values instead of conditions, I recommend looking into my other video. I recorded it before this one. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's all for today. If you want to see some more of this, you can subscribe to my channel. And then I hope, uh, I hope to see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.